Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Pariso. I work for the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association, and I am the New Hampshire Pro Start State Coordinator. We are thrilled to be able to offer this webinar to you today. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's the first of many. And off to Jackie to introduce the, the event. Well, thank you, Amy, and thank you, New Hampshire Pro Start, for partnering with us today. You asked for a closer look at vegetarian cuisine and ACF listened. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we are so excited to be here today just for you, the future leaders of the food service industry. Before we begin, as a note, we will be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and the Q&A function to pose questions to the chef. So let's test that out in the chat. Let us know your favorite vegetarian food or your favorite vegan dish. I'm Jackie Pressinger and I'm honored to be here today. I'm American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships. And I am especially excited because my culinary training actually began at a high school culinary program in New Hampshire, just like many of you. So I can't wait to get started. So let me introduce a friend, a colleague, and a talented young culinarian who's also going to be today's moderator. Chef Ashley Garrett is president of the ACF Young Chefs Club, which includes all ACF members under the age of 25. He is also the USA's Young Chefs Ambassador to the World Association of Chef Societies, and he has earned his bachelor's degree from Johnson & Wales University. He's a ProSART program alumni and currently works as senior culinary manager at the Marriott in Cleveland, Ohio, and he was a recent winner on Guy's Grocery Games on the Food Network. So welcome, Ashton. Thank you, Jackie, and honored to be here. Thank you. Great. And at this time, I'd love to turn it over to our featured chef speaker, Chef Keith Saracen. Chef, can you let us know a little bit about yourself and what you do in the food service industry? Well, welcome from New Hampshire. I am so excited with y'all today. Uh, my name is Keith Saracen. I am the founder and head chef over at the Farmer's Dinner. And what the Farmer's Dinner is fun, we, uh, we do dinners on all across New England. Uh, basically, where there's no run water electricity on these gorgeous farms, we set up dinners. Um, and we've been doing that since 2012. Uh, it's crazy. Um, so we're super excited to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a lot about my passion, uh, supporting local farms. But also, I'm going to tell you why I really, really love cooking with plants and plant-based lifestyle. Um, it kind of started in a weird way, right? So we've worked since 2012, we've hosted 88 dinners on farms across New England. Uh, we've raised just under a quarter million dollars for local farms. And one of the things that we kept hearing from these farmers is how we would, you know, all these people would buy prime cuts of animals. But what would happen is all these off cuts would go to waste. So we started utilizing that. And then we realized something really cool. We realized that during the course of it, we were able to help support farms by buying things that they normally didn't use, um, that normally didn't get used. Then it became even more prevalent when we started talking about plants. So what a farm produces goes to waste. Pretty statistic when you think about it, right? So what we did is we decided that we wanted to use plants in a much better way. Uh, so we started buying B grades, we started buying all those things that weren't perfect, right? And then we realized really quickly that if we started treating plants with the same reverence that we treated proteins, we were going to change the game. So we started marinating and brining and we started smoking and grilling. And you know what happened? We created some really great products. So I'm super excited to share with you today um, one of the things that we do uh, we love to make cheese now i know you're thinking cheese right that's not vegan but here's the cool thing we can make an incredible cheese that will blow your mind from nothing more than just soaked cashews like these so these soaked cashews are the basis uh, of one of the same plant-based cheeses that we use all the time at the farmer's dinner so i'm super excited ashen are you excited over there chef Chef, I'm beyond excited. I can't wait for you to start. Um, and I, cheese has been in my diet for since I was probably a baby. So I'm 
very, very excited to see how you can turn that into a vegan and vegetarian presentation. Um, actually, before we get started, uh, just a message to the audience. There is a poll on your webinar um, asking, how do you feel about vegetarian and vegan cuisine? So do you love it? Are you not sure yet? And um, we invite all of our guests and guest viewing to interact with us on the poll and let us know how we're doing and, um, and uh, how you feel about vegetarian and vegan cuisine. So we're going to flip it back over to Chef. Chef, let's see how you make some cashew cheese. Let's, let's get started. I love it. And get those questions out there. I'm super excited to interact with all of you as we do this. So let's start this cashew cheese. Real simple process. It's going to get a little noisy because we've got to use blender. Um, so the first thing I do is I measure out about two cups of cashews. You'll see them, like I said, right there. Um, and then I'm going to soak these for a minimum of six hours. Um, I like to soak them overnight. Uh, as they start to, to soak overnight, they get real, real, real soft. You can see they just kind of fall apart real easy there. And that's what I'm gonna look for. So I'm gonna soak those overnight, which I did last night, throw two cups in there. And then I have the water, right? The water that the cashew is soaked in. So the general rule is if I'm using so the water, four cups of water, I'm gonna throw that right in. I'm gonna go a little bit less. So I wanna get this thing started right about there. So the cashews, when they blend up, they're gonna get really, really, really thick very quickly. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna slowly start to temper in some of this water and let's get this started. So we're gonna get this started right real quick. All right, here we go. This is gonna get loud for a second. <laughs> Cool, so all I wanted to do right there is give it a little initial spin. Just an initial spin. I'm trying to just chopped up a bit. Now I'm gonna add my, my spices. So one of the things I love is I've got paprika, I've got turmeric. The reason I use turmeric is for the color. Um, garlic powder, onion powder, boom. We're gonna throw that in. And then the magic ingredient, the thing that makes it cheesy right here you can smell that it's nutritional yeast and nutritional yeast is so great because it gives it this cheesiness that you know so we're going to throw in about half a cup of nutritional yeast and then i'm going to take some lemon juice right here boom throw that right in we're going to do that and we are going to let this thing rip Yeah, what I'm, I'm gonna pause it out often just to give you guys some tips on this. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm gonna need to blend this a lot, right? There's a lot of emulsification that needs to happen. There's a lot of blending because those cashews are gonna release a lot of that, that, that thickening agent, right? They need to be, it needs to be a straight, straight, straight puree. So it's gonna take a bit. So I'm gonna keep coming back and giving you guys some tips on this. Chef, this is Matt, the producer. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. So it sounds uh, your laptop, unfortunately, is where you have your audio connected, and that is cutting it in and out like crazy. Is there sure. a way that we can relink your audio to your mobile device? So sure bear can. with us, everybody. You usually don't hear my name unless we have a technical issue, and that's exactly what's going on right now. But that's the joy of live interactivity and Zoom. So we're going to come to Ashton and Hey, Ashton, you're on the spot. So I'm going to make this awkward for you. You want to read the results of the poll while sure. Chef gets his microphone situated. Not a problem, Matt. So right now we have the question was posed. How do you feel about vegetarian cuisine? And we've had a great response so far. We had 66 percent. Uh, say that they love it. So 43 out of 65 um, have, have chosen that they love it. And some of you are, are not sure yet. 43% um, are not sure. And, and just like myself, um, I've actually been a vegetarian for about a year and a half now. And uh, I, I made that transition um, just for, for health and diet reasons. Um, I also kind of got interested while I was in school, um, while I was in the abroad. Chef, Chef, are you there? Yeah, I'm here now. Can you guys hear me? think so we're just having yes, a much problem. better thank you okay yeah sorry about that you know yeah sorry about that you know what's up covid what's up covid 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, keep going, Ashley. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt you, you, bro? No, no, you're fine. No, yeah, I'm I'm interested in what you're what you're creating with the cashew cheese. So now I was just saying, you know, like uh, you know, my experiences with vegetarian and vegan cuisine has you know taken me all over the world, and it's been an honor, you know, just to be in different cuisine and learn different things. So um, I kind of wanted to ask you early on in the onset, you know, like um, have some of those experiences maybe with different chefs or different friends, colleagues inspired you to to try vegan and vegetarian cuisine. Yeah, that's a great, great, great question. So uh, one of the guys that we employ now, his name is Matt Jackson. Uh, you can find him at Matt Jackson Live because I want to give him a plug on Instagram. Uh, he's a vegan chef, plant-based chef. He's vegan. He has been for four years. The thing that's cool about Matt is he's taught me so much. He was a, a executive chef in Hawaii, and he learned so, so, so much about just taking, you know, the things that we're used to, the burgers, stuff like that, and putting a plant-based spin on it. And so I've been working really hard on just kind of understanding how to take, you know, things like beyond impossible and really kind of put my spin on them. So I've been able to come up with really cool burger recipes with Matt on um, stuff that, you know, we kind of look at as comfort food, which we never thought we could do. And now we're having a blast with it. So it's been a, it's been real fun. That's awesome, Chef. And you, you mentioned um, kind of like a, a staple name, you know, with uh, Beyond and Impossible. There's often, you know, some misconceptions about those, in particular, those two brands. Uh, could you speak more about, you know, like what, what those brands offer, maybe from a nutritional standpoint? Sure, absolutely. So nutritionally, there's a lot of sodium, right? We're getting a lot of sodium and in, in Beyond and, and uh, obviously Impossible. And there's a lot of controversy with the heme side of things. So with Impossible, they, they isolated plant heme, which means it can actually bleed, which is crazy. Um, I've had both products. I love both products. Um, but right now we're trying to figure out, you know, this, this plant forward lifestyle isn't going anywhere. It's the same place that we were 10 years ago when people were like, oh, this farm to table thing, it's a fad. Right. This isn't a fad. This is, this is becoming the norm. And it, I don't know if it replaces um, our traditional omnivore diet, but I know one thing for sure, that everybody is going to need to shift into having really solid vegan options. And to me, as somebody who wants to eat more plant forward, I'm super embracing it because you're going to see stuff today like this cashew cheese that we can just make insane food from. So I'm right. stoked. That's awesome, Chef. No, that's uh, you made an interesting point, I think, for everybody, you know, in terms of that shift, you know, just from 10 years ago what the what the lifestyle was, you know, farm to table, you know, and, and where it is now um, and where it can be 10 years from, from now. So um, we employ all our audience, you know, just keep asking us questions. You know, you guys are doing great, sending in, you know, great uh, comments and everything like that. I've seen, um, you know, some of you are, are pescatarian, some of you are, you know, full vegetarian. Um, so chef, could you explain the distinguishment uh, between pescatarian, vegetarian, maybe even Presbyterian, and, and full-on vegan. You know, I, I, again, there's just so much misconception um, as to why, you know, um, the, the rhetoric and advertising for vegan versus vegetarian. So could you explain some of that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, pescatarian, obviously, uh, we, we focus on eating fish. Um, vegetarian versus vegan is something I get a lot. So for our dinners um, on, on farms, you can buy an omnivore ticket or you can buy a vegan ticket. So we kind of 86 the whole vegetarian ticket. And the reason we did that is for us to take the step from vegan, uh, from vegetarian to vegan, isn't really hard anymore, right? right. We have some really great products like the cashew cheeses, um, Miyoko's, kind of give a shout out to them. Um, Miyoko's right here does incredible butters, cheeses. Um, her book uh, is, is incredible, uh, all on vegan cheeses. So we've hit a point where we're starting to get, there's just, there's no reason not to take that next step. And for us, it was some, it was as simple as just dynamics, right? So if you think about it like this, if somebody's vegetarian and comes to our dinner, great, they can buy a vegetarian ticket. If somebody was vegan and we only, only offered a vegetarian ticket, and then we did a vegetarian dish, then it would exclude them. So for us, challenge was to take that next step. And we've seen just such a better result with it. Oh, chef. That's, that's incredible. Can you, so, can you do me a favor? Can you read some of the questions? I want to blend this and then yeah. uh, keep this working. 
Sure, no problem, sir. Um, I, I'll start with uh, a question that I have, actually. Um, I want to know, is there a substitute for the cashews? Can you use any other nut? Does it have to be cashews? What other nuts um, might you want to replace? Yeah, perfect. Um, so it's done with almonds a lot of time. Uh, there's a way of, of, so think about it like this. What we're trying to do with cheese is get that sourness, right? We're right. trying to develop that underlying sourness. Um, and that can be done through almond. Uh, you can replace almonds instead of the cashews. The trick with almond is you have to soak it a lot, lot, lot longer. It needs to be a right. bare minimum of 24 hours. Sure. Um, and they have to be husked. Uh, we want to take off all that skin on the almonds so that they're, you just have that like blanched look of the almond. Um, the other thing is coconut, you can do it. So if you think about it like this, if you were to take any cultured butter, if you were to take butter and just culture it, that's what we're doing. We're interjecting that lactobacillus, we're interjecting that acidophilus, that stuff that's gonna start to sour it a bit. And then all we need to do is start thickening it. I've seen people use vegan cheeses with agar um, okay. and, and thickening agents that way. So it's what we're trying to do is develop two things, texture, and that beautiful kind of sourness that we get out of cheese. Sure. That makes sense? Yes, absolutely. And um, does the lemon juice help in that process as well? Exactly. Right. So that's why so, we're, yeah. we got nutritional yeast. We've got the sourness uh, from the lemon. The um, I like the smokiness. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. I like that smokiness from the back end. The other thing I like to do with this, and you, you might see me do when we start to pour it in the pan, is I like to put a little bit of hot sauce in there. That's okay. again, that sourness of the vinegar that right. kind of gives it a kick. So you know, de developing your style of this is super important. And when we put up the recipe for this, I have a note at the bottom that says, this is the base cheese recipe and it's just nutritional yeast, the cashews and stuff like that. Sure. Um, from there, you can take it into the Mornay realm. You can take it into like that kind of style if you wanted to, to start searing off some onion and then putting the cashew cheese in that. It doesn't have to be yellow either. Right. You know, the yellow just comes from the turmeric. So I want you guys to think outside of the box because that's what we do as chefs. You know this, Chef. Right, exactly. No, absolutely, Chef. And it seems like, you know, you're building that foundation. And you mentioned something, you know, I think uh, all culinarians, you know, kind of that, that might have gone to school or on the, on, the, uh, me, on the early onset, learning about Mornay's and mother sauces and things like that. And how's that the, the foundation for other sauces? Um, so we do have a question. And Chef, uh, for the young chefs out there, what are some of the common mistakes that, you know, early on that, you know, chefs deal with vegetarian and vegan cooking? You know, was it more technical issues or the, the skill of actually knowing the ingredients? What would you think? I, I love this question. Um, so thank you. Keep those questions coming in. So some of the big mistakes that we see in the beginning is we think about vegetarian and vegan food as lettuce, right? Right. I, I'm exactly. This all the time. Right. Or, or kale or romaine. It. Exactly. Yep. Right. We think about it as like, okay, you know, it's lettuce on a plate. You know, what else can they eat? And no, we treat vegetables, especially in the West, as this side dish or this starter dish. We don't treat vegetables, especially when it comes to brassicas, right? Uh, cabbages, things like that. We think about that stuff not as a main component. From an early age, I think when we start cooking, we're taught starch, protein, vegetable, you know, but that's not how it works. As you guys get to that level, you understand we're balancing herbaceousness fattiness, acidity, you know, textures. Those are the things that we look for in a dish. So here's my question to you. Why can't vegetables be that, right? Right. Like, wh why can't we take a vegetable like a cabbage and start applying smoke and the methods that we would for barbecuing? There's no reason we can't because when we start to do that, we're taking, if you ever think, you know, let's take cauliflower as a good example. Sure. If we take a cauliflower steak, right, chef? and we cut that nice and thick, we get texture out of there. We get a really nice meaty texture. Right. Now let's say we're, we're brining that cauliflower just like we would um, a head cheese or something like that, right? We brine that cauliflower, obviously it's much less time. We're pulling that, we're applying a method like smoking to it, and then we're basting it just like we would any brisket, just like we would any beautiful cut of meat. What do you think that does to that dish that elevates it on so many different levels? For sure. When we start in this country thinking about proteins and other food or mains, I think is a better way of describing. When we think about mains as it doesn't need to be meat, 
we start opening up a world of possibilities. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, no. Thank you for that input, Chef. And uh, you brought up a good point with the cauliflower steak. You know, um, at my restaurant, or excuse me, at the restaurant that you know I'm uh, currently employed at. You know, we we do a di- uh, different div- uh, derivation with broccoli. We got to do a tempura, um, and you know, we're able to you know kind of. I guess twist the con- the conception of what we have. We call it broccoli wings, and we you know toss it with the sesame um, you know dressing, and it's like you know it's something completely different for our guests. And they're like, wow, you know, like doesn't taste like broccoli. Certainly doesn't look like broccoli. It can't be broccoli. And I think you know as we evolve and as our taste buds you know begin to you know kind of um, get better in in terms of you know sense of texture and taste, you know things are gonna be, you know be different uh, for us all. So thank you for that input, Chef. And uh, the, we have another question. Can you define what plant forward means? You know, again, there's so much advertising, chef, you know, about what plant forward is. You can go to the grocery store, see a magazine, you know, have different recipes that say plant forward this, plant forward that. But in your personal opinion, what does that mean? You know, like, and maybe if you could, um, you know, kind of tell a story or background as to, you know, what, what plant forward means to you. Yeah, oh man, I, I love these questions. Keep them coming because that's money. And Ashton, you're doing a great job. Thank you, Chef. No problem, um, Chef. So what does plant, <laughs> you're the best. Um, what does plant forward mean? Um, I'm going to define it in kind of my, my loose um, vocabulary here. So I think of plant forward as just what I was saying previous. Um, meat's great. I'm not, a ve- I'm not a vegetarian and I'm not a vegan. I drastically reduce the amount of meat that I put in my diet Um, because I want to showcase all these beautiful vegetables. So for me, plant forward means putting the plant forward. And I know that sounds simple, right guys? But it's something as simple as saying, hey, this is an incredible cabbage. This is an incredible um, radish. Like how can I showcase this as the centerpiece? It's hard to wow people. Like, let's just be honest, right? If I get a radish, and I go, okay, I want to wow you guys with this radish, or I want to wow you guys with this wacko. Two different things. We said sure. that. But why can we, can't we start saying, there's the radish. Um, radishes are cover crops, which means in the spring, they're planted a lot, especially in New England. Um, they're planted to just cover all these other crops. Sure. Uh, the name of a cover crop. And from the leaves all the way to the root, how can we utilize that? Well, maybe we, we're taking the entirety of the radish and we're taking it in sections and saying, okay, the leaves go to this part. Maybe I'm making this killer uh, piece stew with it. Maybe I'm, I'm doing a gremolata. Like, let's think outside of the box with it. Now, the radish, how can, you know, what are the components? And this is the way I kind of plan my meals. What are the components of a radish that, that hit my senses? You know, uh, the clean kind of wateriness to it is something I love about a radish. Um, that kind of a little bit of a bite, especially when you're talking about breakfast radishes. So how can I then elevate those things and balance them out? So what does a radish need a lot of a time? A lot of times, a little bit of sweetness. Right. Maybe that can come from a barbecue sauce. Maybe that can come from, maybe I can bring a salty texture by bringing in a really nice miso. You know, um, maybe our cheese sauce, because it has that sourness, can complement that. So these are the things that we need to be thinking of. And when we do that, we put the plant forward. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, absolutely, Chef. No, I think, you you know, building flavors, um, just like what you're doing with, with your cheese sauce. So what's the next step in this process, Chef? Perfect. So I was just, just getting the texture. I could blend it a little bit longer. Okay. But I don't think we need to at this point. Um, what you're looking for in the cheese sauce is a nice, smooth consistency. Right now, mine's just a little bit under what I'd want to do. So what I want to do is I want to heat this. So I'm going to take that in. Again, we're looking, it's almost like, at this point, it's almost like a creme anglaise, right? Right, (laughs) It's got that that look and feel to it. So what I want to do is I want to get this nice and hot. Um, Mine right now is a little bit more watery than I want it. And so the nice trick with this is what do we do when we have something that's too, that's too watery? Just simmer it down. Right. Yeah, reduce it down. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And so this is no different. That's why I wanted to do this today for you guys, because it's foolproof. Um, when I taste this right now, I'm getting that nutritional yeast. I'm getting the smokiness of the paprika. I'm getting this beautiful kind of like sharp head of the lime. And it feels like a cheese sauce. It just needs to reduce a bit. And that's not a problem at all. So we're going to let this reduce. Um, and this is the basis of what I use for mac and cheese all the time. So I have, um, I just picked up some chickpea, uh, some chickpea 
beautiful little macaroni over here. Um, I love these penne's. These are awesome. Um, I like them because they have a lot of fiber too, right? Okay. So my girlfriend's gluten free. Um, so I'm always, always doing gluten free pastas, whether I'm making it by hand or whether I'm buying it in box. Because let's be honest, sometimes we're at home and we need to buy it by box. Exactly. Um, she <laughs> cheated just a little bit. Cheated just a little bit. I understand. <laughs> Some, we just got to keep it real, right? Right. I'm not. I'm not going to serve this in my restaurants. What I'm going to do though is this cheese sauce is the perfect vehicle. So when she found out I was doing this today, she's like, "Can you make it gluten free? We can have lunch." So yeah, sometimes we do that. That's awesome. So, <laughs> um, so all I want to do is I'm going to bring this to a boil right now, and uh, um, once it hits a boil, I'm going to reduce it, um, reduce the temp just a little bit, and we're going to. Thankfully, inductions are great to cook on because they boil so quick. Um, and this is going to come together real quick. Couple of notes about cheese sauce when you make it. So once you reduce it a bit, and once it thickens, understand once it, it gets hot, it's going to change its structure a bit. Once that cools again, you're going to have a much thicker product. So you're going to see very quickly. Remember how I said this looks like a creme anglaise? Right. Already, we're starting to thicken up, tremendously thicken up, um, and that's thanks to the structure of the cashew. Okay. So I'm going to get this thicker and in about two minutes, you're going to see this whole dish come together real quick. Oh, chef. Wonderful. Uh, we do have a question, chef. And um, they would like to know how would uh, using different vinegars in place of lemon juice affect the cheese in terms of maybe yeah. uh, structural properties or just a fermentation process? So a couple of things. It depends on the pH. Uh, if I'm going to replace the lemon juice uh, with a vinegar, I want to keep around the same pH. Um, I love, and, and this is something I challenge y'all, I love to cook with vinegar and I use it as a replacement for salt all the time. Um, one of my friends uh, did the fermentation program at Noma and when wow. he it was doing a talk in Boston, um, I went and he talked about how on the line at Noma, they got rid of all salt, which is crazy to think about, right? Like That's I grew cool. up with, this is what you do, you got salt on the line. Um, and he said, no, we don't have any salt on our line. All we have is a series of vinegars. And I think about that every time still to this day. Um, so I would challenge you to add different vinegars. Um, be careful because vinegars can, depending on the vinegar, be on the sweeter side. Um, I do a pineapple weed vinegar, which is a wild chamomile because uh, um, I do a lot of foraging. Um, so I do that a lot. Uh, I love that vinegar, but I wouldn't want to add that to this because it would change the property. Uh, chef, just real quick. Look at that. Wow. Completely change its structure, right? That's incredible. See how that's nice and thick now? Right. I'm just about at the consistency of what I want for mac and cheese. Just about there. And you said, Chef, part of that is from the cashew. How much of that is from the yeast, actually? Does the yeast do anything? Absolutely does. See, you're good at what you do, <laughs> Chef. Um, exactly. So the yeast is actually acting as a thickening agent as well. So this is like, it's, it's just creating this nice, thick cheese. Now understand, now we change the structure of this. So if I let this cool and put this in a sheet pan, it would get a lot thicker. So now that I've changed the structure of it, now's the time I wanna start adding my mac and cheese, but you're hundred percent right. The yeast has a huge role to play in that. Sure. Chef, we do have another question. Um, and briefly before I say this, uh, we invite all audience members to, if you have a question, use the Q and A function on the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom panel. Uh, so we have Chef, what is one product you see as the future of plant forward diets? So what do you see coming, coming to light in the, and maybe in the next five, 10 years, or maybe even beyond that? I love that question. A um, couple of them. I'm going to give you a couple. Uh, the first is TVP. Um, this beautiful thing right here. Okay. Textured vegetable protein. Um, textured vegetable protein. What it does is it allows you to have the, it's a fiber structure that allows you to mimic the texture of meat. Um, so I make, I th I've taken a bunch of pictures of this on my Instagram, but I make a 100% vegan burger. It's red. It looks exactly like a burger. Its taste is just out of control. And when I was kind of r and ding that, uh, TVP or texture vegetable protein was something that I use a lot. Um, you'll see it used in, if you went to like Walmart or something, picked up vegan chicken nuggets, there's a good chance it'll either be seitan, which is um, vital wheat gluten or TVP. Those are the two binding agents you see a lot because it has a structure that is like meat. Uh, TVP for me hasn't even begun to see its heyday. Um, it is 
Here, let me open some of it up uh, just to give you guys a look at it. It kind of looks like, almost like cereal, right? Right. Um, but it's got this very neutral flavor and think of it almost like a breadcrumb, right? Because if I start throwing water to that, it expands and it, can, and it takes in all that flavor. So TVP is what I use for my base for all of my vegan burgers, along with uh, methyl cellulose, high volume. Um, I use a mushroom powder from Dunk's Mushrooms. Uh, There's this guy in New Hampshire who grows an incredible um, assortment of mushrooms. I basically dehydrate those down and powder it. So TVP is one. And uh, the other thing I think that is going to have its heyday is you're going to see a lot of use um, for uh, vegan butters and cheeses. So this is one quick cheese. And just to give you an idea, this is what our mac and cheese looks like. God, that looks delicious, chef. <laughs> it's not bad, right? Wow. Straight vegan. Um, it's got that beautiful little yellow thing, that yellow tint to it. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I'll put a picture of it on my, on my story today on Instagram, plate it up. Um, and it's just mac and cheese. We're not, we're not doing any professional plate in here, but we're having the comforts of it. So I think uh, vegan cheeses is another one because you're going to start to see um, Miyoko's Creamery is doing a smokehouse cheddar that is just out of this world. Um, you're going to see a lot of um, a lot of other places. Uh, there's there's three or four others. Uh, there's one called Pamela um, that's yeah. doing a Gouda that's sliced and aged. Um, they straight up age the cashews, um, which is a process that I do as well. Um, and that Gouda just melts perfectly and it is just out of this world tasty. So I think that's another one you're gonna see. Okay, Chef, thank you. And as you, you know, mentioned with, you know, with the TVP, right? Um, we do have a question. Uh, can you explain like more in depth, where does that come from? You know, what it was, you know, and before I would like to shift gears kind of to like GMO, you know, kind of process ingredients. Yeah. And that's, you know, often a misconception with vegan and sometimes vegetarian cuisine. And it, that kind of strays away, you know, the, the misinformed consumer, you know, saying like, oh, no, this was made in the lab or, you know, we shouldn't eat this because, you know, um, it, it's processed in a, in a test tube. So can you kind of speak to, you know, some of that shift? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so let's first tackle the GMO side of it, right? Right. So there, you're right. There is a lot of stuff that is GMO based because we're taking a bunch of ingredients and putting it together. So you're going to have that, that GMO style of, of things at times. Um, what I always say, if you're, lo if you're listening to this right now and you want to get more plant forward, here's two things that you can do to eliminate GMOs. One, find some recipes that you love that are simple, like this cashew cheese, right? Like something as simple as, you know, we always say in the culinary world, um, people will see, you know, Netflix and, and watch the chef's table. And they're like, I can do that. You can't. And if you can do that, great. Now you got to do it for 150 people a night, seven days a week. Um, so let's start small. So what we want to do is we want to come up with, with something that doesn't have a lot of GMOs in it. Um, this is a really simple uh, cheese that's based off of cashews, a couple of ingredients and some nutritional yeast. As we start to expand our repertoire a bit, whether that's TVP, or other things, work on deconstructing that a bit. I like Beyond Burgers, I like Beyond Sausages, I like Impossible, but what I thought I wanted to do was pull out the stuff that I didn't think I needed. They're a company that needs to ship all over the world sure. and respect for them for doing that, but because they need to do that, there's fillers that they need to add. There's more sodium that they need to add because they need to keep that shelf stable. If I'm making this at home, I don't need that stability. I can rip out the stuff that I want. And the third thing, I think this is the third point, um, start treating vegetables like we treat meat. At the end of the day, eating plant forward needs to be a healthy thing. There's a lot of vegan junk food. And guess what? It's still junk food. It's right. still filler. Um, when we start looking at the plants, when we start looking at produce and saying, I'm going to put this as my centerpiece rather than that steak or that pork or that fish. When we start doing that, we start really changing the game. And then we're not dealing with GMOs. We're not dealing with that. We're just dealing directly with farms. Um, I love the question about vinegar. I think we need to be adding more vinegar and um, using more vinegar, especially in the West. Um, it's something we just don't do enough of. And think of those umamis, right? Think of uh, black vinegar, Chinese vinegar is incredible for this. Uh, think of mushrooms as a, as a sense of umami. 
Um, think of ways to develop umami, uh, burnt veg, uh, so caramelized, deep, deep, deep caramelized vegetables sure. will do this too, which is how you get TVP a lot of times. It's this fibrous product. So if I'm going to make a vegan stock, one of the things that I want to do is I want to take the vegetables to the limit. I want to cook them low and slow and let them get that deep, deep, deep darkness. Then I'm going to throw them in a pot and let that reduce. Then we're put it, producing umami. Right. Chef, thank you for that. It's again like that, you know, GMO perception is is everywhere, as, as you probably can, you know, imagine and alluded to. And just, you know, saying, you know, you don't have to necessarily change your diet. I know for me, Chef, you know, like when I changed my diet about a year and a half ago, my body was not accustomed to just like Ashton, you know, you're just going to go to all vegetables right now, you know, and I think for anybody that's making a drastic change in their diet, like start slow, you know, it's a domino effect, you know, like move, move the, we had meatless Mondays, chef, as, as I'm sure you probably know about that. And, you know, a Friday we would substitute a meal and kind of slowly and surely I, my body start to, you know, become susceptible to different things. So thank you for that input, chef. No, it's, it's really great that you, you know, said the things that, that uh, needed to be heard. Um, we also have another question, chef, for nut allergies, what can, you know, this vegan cheese that this tremendous vegan cheese that you made, can you substitute anything else that, you know, doesn't revolve around nuts? You know, nuts is, as you as I'm sure you know, is a pretty, you know, abundant uh, allergy issue. So uh, what else could you use? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's something that we actually get a lot because understand that a lot of things are, are used, um, nuts are used a lot in vegan food, especially nowadays. So um, from a cheese perspective, um, I ha don't have a lot of, um, don't have a lot of experience with it yet. But there's ways of cultivating some of the plant-based milks that I've been seeing now um, and taking those down. So um, I, I spent a lot of time doing Indian food. Um, it's, it's my passion, studying Indian culture and cuisine. And there's to make paneer, um, which is a, a simple kind of like Indian pressed cottage cheese. You take milk down, reduce it, um, lemon juice, and then that curd you take and tie off. So there's a lot of people experimenting with companies like Not Milk. Uh, not milk is a um, primarily pea-based uh, protein. They have some other things like um, for a little bit of sweetness, they, they put in some pineapple juice. So I want to start experimenting, and this is something that I'm going to be doing next, reducing not milk to see what our consistency is, see if I can get it to curdle, see if I can get it to tie off and press. Um, traditionally, you'd think you can't, but I'm watching more and more people, and you can start Googling this too, and I'd recommend it. Um, take these plant-based milks and start to get them to levels that they can start to remove some of that fat. And when you remove the fat, then there's a lot of things that you can do with it. So that's something that I'm personally looking into a lot of. And so I don't have a ton of answers on that. When it comes to meat, your uh, like faux meat, um, your options open up a lot. Uh, so you're looking at textured vegetable proteins. You're looking at seitan again, which is just vital wheat gluten. And that starts to get a lot, um, that opens up the doors a lot more. Okay, Shay, thank you. Um, and to the audience, we uh, do have 20 minutes left. So if any more you know, last minute questions or any questions that you would like to you know, uh, be heard from Chef on this wonderful presentation, please feel free to drop them in the q and I uh, just as a little reminder. And Chef, you know, as you mentioned with TVP, right? Um, I, I like to kind of shift, gear, uh, shift gears with that and, and in terms of that perspective. So we hear, you know, beyond, like I said, impossible, what is the main binder that makes the meat stick? You know, when it hits the grill or hits the, the sear, you know, how does it not necessarily, you know, just go everywhere, right? Um, is that more of a chemical? Is that more, you know, natural protein? What, what, is, what does that look like? So I'll let you know how I do it because um, I, I haven't worked for them and I don't know their formula fully. Sure. So I'll read the ingredients and get an idea, but I'll let you know how I do it. Um, so what I do is I start with TVP, textured vegetable protein. And then from there, I add a couple of things. For me, um, one of the things that's really important is uh, methyl cellulose high volume. Um, so the HV side of it. What this does is I start basically using um, methyl cellulose HV with a little bit of water. And what okay. I slowly do is I need a very liquid, pure, pure, pure coconut oil. Um, real, real nice. And I start to slowly drizzle that in. And what that does is that whipping effect starts to make the whole thing just gain volume. And I take that on a sheet pan and I lay it out and then I put that in the freezer. Once it's frozen, I take a fork and I start shredding it because I'm looking for these little pea size droplets. And what that's doing is that's mimicking fat because we need fat in a burger. We need to sizzle when we put it on a grill or, or a saute pan. Right. So 
I take all that snow, you know, if you will, and I put it in a quart container and I start to go from there, from the, the binding agent TVP. Because when you think about something that looks like this, think of how much water it's gonna, it's gonna need. So I use, um, I use just a hair of soy, uh, soy sauce. Um, I use mushroom powder um, and I start to slowly fold this in. Uh, the other thing that I use all the time is beetroot powder to give it that redness. Um, and I, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a consistency that looks like ground meat. Right. Um, it has that same sort of crumbly kind of feel to it. From there, once I let that set, cause you want to let the TVP set for a bit um, cause it's going to continue to absorb everything. I have a bunch of other ingredients in it as well that are like uh, spices and things. Then I'm going to fold in that, that snow that we made. What that's doing is that's, you're going to start to see it come together and it looks marble. Um, it looks like it has those specks of fat, like a burger would. So it's, it took me a long time and a lot of questions to other chefs who are way smarter than I am uh, to figure out how to make a burger that I thought was just mud. So we're really looking at trying to stretch the limits of what we, what we do. And as you bite into the TVP when it's cooked, remember, it's already soft. Right. It's already like cooked at that point point uh you're getting this beautiful sear on the outside so it's changing the texture from a nice crunchy outside to this beautiful soft inside and you bite in it's got that pop of umami from the mushrooms and it has that meatiness both in feel and taste and that's what we look for when we develop vegan recipes you brought up an interesting point chef you know in terms of it takes a long time and you need to ask a lot of questions to a lot of different people yeah. and uh for any young chef out there you know this is a, a marathon, it's not a sprint you know, for any cuisine, you know, that like you want to, you know, engage with different chefs, mentors, you know, find, read different books. You know, I'm sure as chef, you know, Saracen can attest to that, you know, it takes, you know, knowledge on the, both the back end and experimentation, you know, to create recipes like vegan cheese and, you know, uh, a mushroom burger and things like that. So uh, thank you for your input, chef. And, and real quick, we have another question. I think this is a very interesting question. Um, chef, as we move forward, you know, to this uh, vegan and plant forward uh, type of cuisine, how do you, or what advice can you give to, uh, for chefs now or chefs kind of that old school chef feel that are kind of stuck in their ways that don't want to transition into a different period um, or don't see vegan, you know, whether it's profitable or whether it's trendy. Um, so, you know, what are some things that, that you might um, advise? I love that question. So um, listen, change is hard, right? Um, especially with folks who understand that like, Hey, I've been doing this, this recipe, um, for a million years and uh, I love it. And my, my clientele loves it. The reality is this, we can, I think if there's one, one word that we hate more than anything in 2020, it's what? Pivot. Right. So tired of this word. But the reality is this is something that we've always had to do with chefs. We just never spoke that word as much as we did. Um, this vegan and plant forward cuisine is not a fad. Mark me on this one. It's recorded. Talk to me in 10 years. This isn't going anywhere. All we're going to see is we're going to see an emergence of it. We're seeing this in the West Coast. We're seeing this even on the East Coast. We're seeing this in the heartland of America. Um, people are flocking toward this. This does not mean everyone needs to open a vegan restaurant. That's right. not what I'm saying at all. But there is no point in having a vegetarian option on the menu when you can make it vegan at, at this point. You know, I get it. I mean, some people are lacto ego, um, where, you know, it's hard to re replace that egg. Matt Jackson, during uh, last year, did, on one of our dinners, literally did a course that was a vegan egg. And he did it through just really breaking down of how to get that. Uh, one of the ways that he got that feel of an egg was kala namak, which is a, a sulfur salt that they use a right. lot in India. Um, and to watch people be blown away, he basically made a vegan hollandaise and, and capped it as a yolk. So like you think about how beautiful it was and, and the pictures I think are up on, on the farmer's dinner Instagram. It was just this gorgeous dish and people are like, how am I not eating an egg? Like, why are we taking, uh, you know, I'm, I know about my time on the line and before plant forward cuisine, we would always say, you know, man, like we got another vegan in the house. What do we have? You know, let's give him some lettuce. We don't feel that way at all anymore. I'm stoked exactly. when vegans come in to the farmer's dinner. I'm stoked when they come in to any of the restaurants that I'm working with. I'm like, right, exactly, chef. Exactly. We're like challenge accepted. Let me right. blow their mind. Because when you're looking at something as beautiful as this mac and cheese now, 
that's nice and set and it's good. It's, I'm not going to serve them a mac and cheese in my in my restaurant, but what I am going to do is think about that sauce and say, how what you know what area can I take this? Let's get crazy, let's get weird, and let's get fun with this. It's pretty cool. Chef, that's uh, wow! Oh my gosh, yes. And you know this, the you know it doesn't have to be confined to like you said that kale or that romaine or you know just a lettuce or salad. You know that unfortunately is you know circulating through the propaganda and you know advertising for a lot of different, you know, countries and things like that. So, you know, you can't have fun with it. You can't be free with it. You know, you can just let loose. You know, I think that, you know, my transition, um, if I can just say in my experience has been tremendous because I've been able to, um, you know, just freely kind of just mix and match some things. Now, uh, with that being said, like I said, with experimentation, I have made things that are absolutely horrible, but also on the back end, you know, I've, I've come up with different flavors and said, wow, you know, you kind of take a look back, you know, and, and say, wow. So thank you for that answer, chef. I think a, a lot of students and, and guest viewing can take a lot from that answer. So uh, we have a couple more minutes left. Um, so chef, I would just like for your final remarks, final thoughts, um, just any advice to the younger community and also uh, where you foresee this, you know, this vegan and plant forward um, kind of trend and, and also not necessarily trend, but style of living and also style of cuisine moving forward. Man, I got so much love for you. I can't, <laughs> I can't wait till this is over. We get to hang out and, uh, and cook together, man, because um, you're right on. And I, I love to see you as this young, super talented chef coming up who I can't wait to eat your food. Um, so I'm encouraged by by your generation and where it's going. I appreciate um, you. Thank you. So anytime, my friend. Um, so to try to answer that, a couple of things. Uh, number one, so I live in New Hampshire. I live, breathe, and die in New Hampshire. I love New Hampshire. I think it's the coolest place in the world to live. Um, I love the seasons. I love the farms that we have access to. I work with over 31 different farms in this state. Wow. And because I get that, that variety, I get to have my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the farming world. So if you think about it, and I know we got time, so I'm gonna try to <laughs> get this yeah. as quick as I can. No, you're um, <laughs> cool, I'm just yell in my ear if I'm ranting. Um, because I have access to these farms, I get inspired. Chefs, I'm gonna tell you this by somebody who's worked in this industry for 20 years, written three cookbooks and done a lot of shit. I'm gonna say this, please go visit farms. I cannot stress this enough, man. We have worked so hard. Um, the people that I get to work with, incredibly talented chefs, uh, we always say it starts at the farm. If you don't know your growing seasons, how are you gonna put plant forward out, right? If, you're, if it's December and you wanna put eggplant on your menu and you're a farm to table restaurant, you're not putting eggplant on the menu unless you fermented it. Um, so I cannot stress this enough. Do not be attached to your kitchens um, and stay close to the flame, right? A very famous chef once said that to me at an ACF event. Um, so stay close to the flame and, and stay close to your farm is the other thing I'd say. Where does this go um, to answer that second part? Well, I promise you it's not going anywhere but up. Um, I don't know what the ceiling of it looks like, but I know that it is enough that you as a chef, a lot of times if we're executives and we're on the savory side, we uh, we go pastry, you know, we, we got somebody for that. We don't know how to, you know, we, we relegate that to pastry. The reality is pastry and and all that, they're incredibly talented people. Us as chefs, we don't draw the line at, at sweet. We don't say, oh, well, that's right. somebody else's. As chefs, we need to learn to incorporate that. We have a lot to learn from our pastry chefs. We have a lot to learn from our farmers and we have a lot to learn from the plant-based movement. We are just scratching the surface. And if you're listening to this right now, you are at the beginning of a movement. Think about that, the power of that. You're at the beginning of a movement of plant-based cuisine. Now you can either take these words and say, he's just some guy, or you can say, hey, I'm gonna incorporate this into my cuisines. I'm gonna make sure that my vegan food that I'm putting out my plant-based food we're not looking at it as vegan anymore. We're just looking at it as cuisine. Right. And I promise you, it changes the game. Chef Saracen, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. I think everyone can attest by, you know, how your, your, your poser, uh, your composure, I should say, um, and, and your advice. Thank you so much. And for anyone watching, um, if you took anything from this, as I did, stay close to the flame. And stay close to the flame and, and stay close to the farm because as Chef alluded to, it's only going up from here. 
and you know the dietary restrictions you know things change all the time this world has changed all the time and if you know 2021 taught us anything like chef said it taught us to pivot chef it was an absolute pleasure thank you so much for demoing your cashew uh cheese and, and macaroni hopefully um we, we get to try it or um chefs you can make that at home i know uh we have the recipe getting ready to post and they can find you on your on your instagram and linkedin and everything like that chef correct Absolutely. And, and thank you. Thank you to the ACF. Thank you to everyone who put this together. You guys are the real rock stars. We just get to showcase. Thank you, Chef. I'm going to pass it over to Jackie for our closing remarks. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. And we hope uh, to see you soon. Wow. Thank you so much. I wish I was there. It, it, the, the dish looks delicious. It's almost lunchtime. I, um, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, before we close it all out, Chef Saracen, I was wondering if you had maybe one tip that you'd like to give to the young chefs that are tuning in today. Um, I know that, you know, we're, they're gonna, they're gonna stay close to the flame hopefully and that's a lifelong lesson. Um, but is there something that you wish you had known a few years ago? Yeah, um, my one tip is this, start getting creative with your plant-based food. Make this recipe. You guys are gonna have it today in your hands. I challenge you and please tag me in it on Instagram. I'd love to connect with you guys and help any way I can. Fabulous. Well, a huge virtual round of applause as we thank Chef Saracen and thank Ashton for moderating. It was a great conversation. I know I learned a lot as well, and we appreciate you taking the time to share. Uh, ACF is listening to what you want to see and learn, so we hope that you'll join us for an upcoming webinar. We will be speaking with NASA about culinary nutrition on February 25th in collaboration with Massachusetts Pro Start, and you're all invited. And we also have an excellent Chef's Forum webinar coming up on February 23rd, where we'll learn more about Africa's influence on American cuisine sponsored by Chobani. So we certainly hope to see you there. For more information for culinary news, please check out wearechefs.com. And on behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you, New Hampshire Pro Start. Thank you, Chef Saracen. And thank you all for taking the time to join us today. We'll see you real soon. Thank you very much.